we are very, very sorry for beginning late. There was a technical glitch because of which we couldn't begin the meeting earlier. And thank you so much for staying on. Uh, and a very uh, warm welcome to everybody. Good evening to everybody. This uh, panel is going to be an unmoderated panel. We are just going to be talking about our experiences regarding the idea of intersectionality and gender transformative evaluations and where they meet and how important is it. So welcome again to everybody. I will hand it over to Alpakshi and to take the session forward. Uh, thank you, Amrita. Uh, I will quickly share my screen. So hello, everyone. I am Alpakshi. I am based out of India and uh, a member of Gensa from right from the beginning of Gensa. So who are we? Gensa is a gender and equity network South Asia. It's a special interest group of community of evaluators South Asia. And uh, seek, it's a group who is seeking to learn, share, exchange, and curate innovative solutions and responses to evaluation challenges unique to South Asian countries. So right now we are 200 plus, uh, 250 plus members from seven South Asian countries. And uh, if you have not joined us yet, we urge you to please come and join our platform. We base, this is basically a knowledge sharing platform. We do coffee breaks, we do expert lectures, we do webinars, masterclasses, and try to understand everything that's new in evaluation and what more we can do, especially with gender and Um, So uh, going forward with today's session, so the uh, session is titled Gender Transformative Evaluation and Intersectionality. So we are talking about transformative evaluation here, and uh, why do gender transformative evaluation then need to be intersectional is the first point that I want to bring here. So we are talking about gender transformation and transformation as most of us probably already know it is a very long-term change. It's like, you know, very internal fundamental evolution of your beliefs of why you want to perform certain actions. It's large and like, you know, it requires a fundamental foundational shift from within. And uh, to do this, to talk about transformational change, we have to talk about power. And when we have to power at every point, power from different angles, so, and to address power, it's very important for us to talk about intersectionality. We talk about a 360 degree approach, which means to address this power at all minute and major stages of the evaluation. So, uh, by minute and major, I mean right from the time when we submit proposals to how we review proposals, from where it is coming from, what is the power structure there, how we, you know, accept proposals, who we bring on board to do the evaluation, to obviously, you know, planning the evaluation, designing the evaluation, conducting the evaluation, using methods for the evaluation. How do we then write the evaluation reports? I mean, including smaller minute things like what is the cover page we use? Are we addressing power there? What are the graphics we use? So a lot we say through these minute stages and by 360 degree approach, we mean by being, you know, at least being alert to intersectionality at throughout these processes. And uh, have to accept that it is not an easy process. So uh, right at the beginning, what we would like to talk about is how we don't want intersectionality to be just a buzzword, to be just used throughout, but how it is actually very difficult to bring the lens of intersectionality through this entire process. And some of these difficulties and some of the ways we have overcome it will be talked through in the other presentations. Uh, so my colleague will come in to talk about few experiences of where they could and where they could not use this lens. Uh, moving ahead, uh, so I will quickly now, uh, just, uh, just a second. Oops. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Is my screen visible? 
the effort could be made full screen uh, for Bakshi because it's, it's not full screen? No, it's not. Okay. I'm so sorry. Uh, Mahesh, are you being able to project? Uh, let me just try. Is it happening, Mahesh? Yeah, can you can can you see it? Yeah, yeah, I can see. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you just go to the next to next slide? Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, oh. me, just there. Yeah, thank you. So I'm so sorry. So so then, what is intersectionality, right? That we are talking about. So intersectionality, actually, the theory of intersectionality came out of Black feminism, and it's a term first coined in 1989 by American civil rights advocate and a leading scholar of critical race theory, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. So a lot of uh, feminist movement in the US was a white woman's movement back then. So by white woman's movement means a uh, white woman would raise the issues. So a lot of uh, uh, addressing their problems and a lot of African American movement had their subject as black men. So in between this white, so all whites basically, so this is where all women were ex accepted, to, were understood to be whites and all blacks were men and some of us were brave. So it means that within this uh, movement, some of them got lost in the intersections and the intersections are understood. Uh, so it can be like intersections can be lost. Like some people might get lost at the intersections and some people, might understand these intersections incorrectly. So but this by uh, this, I mean that some common language uh, of like, you know, understanding intersectionality could also be like say double trouble. So black women are doubly oppressed, but uh, say for example, or triply op oppressed. But here we are not talking about doubly oppressed or triply oppressed, which means here like almost the same oppression, which is happening more. But we are talking about the oppression itself being very different. It is not worse, but different. And therefore, it requires a very different lens when you bring in. So intersectionality, therefore, means that when you we look at the intersections, we have to understand each intersection very differently uh, and all the bring in all the possible intersections. And this while doing an evaluation at all stages to, to bring in. Hence, it is very difficult. So, uh, so that, like I said, it calls for a lens to see and understand those at the various spots of these axes and needs a very different analysis and therefore it helps to define the problem differently. So I am not sure if many of you know about, I'll just give an example of a uh, Shahbano case uh, in India and uh, it's basically Muslim women asking for maintenance. See. But she is not doubly oppressed because she is Muslim or a woman and a woman. But she is differently oppressed and the problem needs to be addressed from a very different starting point itself. So uh, what we can understand is that intersectionality is the study of overlapping or intersecting social identities and related systems of oppression, domination, and discrimination. And therefore, the theory suggests and seeks to examine how various biological, social, cultural categories such as race, gender, class, ability, sexual orientation, religion, caste, age, nationality, and other sectarian excess of identities interact on multiple and often simultaneous levels. So this is broadly to talk about what we like what is intersectionality um uh, Manish, can you go to the next slide please yeah so this is the wheel of power and privilege this is developed by sylvia duxworth and here basically we talk about see like this is a wheel with uh which has been localized in a lot of terms but basically you talk about how you are placed at different portions of power when you are closer to the center of the wheel you are closer to power 
and and everyone is at a very different standpoint if you see for example i'm just taking an example say for example the uh, the pie which is out so cis men cis women and trans non binary if you see that pie say for example for a trans and non binary who is an immigrant from a low income say uh, background will have very different starting point from say as compared to a cis man who is an immigrant from a low income so if we then play around with this wheel of intersectionality we will understand how many different social identities then come to play for us and it is so internalized in so many different ways that we need to continuously keep asking or checking on this basically so uh, i won't go into much detail here i just wanted to introduce what intersectionality is and why we are talking about 360 degree of looking at intersectionality and why it is so important when we undertake evaluations i would now uh, request uh, kanchan lama who uh, to come in and talk about a project that she has worked in and how she has used intersectionality uh, in her work yeah thank you so much thank you thank you thank you alpax uh, alpaxi uh, and organizer and can i can i get my slides please <coughs> my my screen is not showing that my slides my she my is could you please fix that <coughs> i am based in nepal uh actually sonal javedi who really encouraged us to join jencha and uh, i am so happy to be with jencha from the beginning but not playing a very active role because of my other engagement i don't get time actually but i follow the uh, jencha's all activities but i think this when you propose this subject in intersectionality i became very much interested because just uh, since 2023 onwards um i to 2021 onward i have been principal investigator for a project in nepal from idrc canada and they are the project design when we designed the project we actually included in the proposal the uh, approaches one three approaches one approach as intersectional approach because of uh, you know the diversity of the um, uh, women in the forest users women is so high uh, and those women, we will go, we are planning to work with those women in forest based enterprises so can i go to the next it is i will share my methodological experience on intersectional approach to you and in the forest background and more the not only general forest but community forestry management groups background um mahesh can you go to the next please i think uh, i intersectional problem statement or intersectional intersectional uh, the purposes or why it is so important is all actually very well explained by alpaxi um but here i just want to stress on that this case study which we did in this project this project was for 30 months it is just finished now and still we are being invited to share the experiences in many places uh this case study draws upon the experience and lesson gained from an interview with the methodology that aimed to empower women in economic roles in the forest context and especially enterprise development we we and implemented the intersectional approach uh, because of the you know better understanding and better uh, articulation of uh, praxis which could be done for you know bringing out the diverse experience of the diverse group of uh, uh, women from different caste ethnicities education background geographical location and all diversity context and uh, that i think i think that uh, we found that uh, that the diversification of the women's interest their needs were so highly uh, you know 
visible once we approached intersectionally. Otherwise, it would not have been possible for us to uh, gain those knowledges and uh, how intersection, how compounded oppression, compounded discrimination, district women's rights, resources, and opportunity, how they it ho holds back their you know, participation and benefit sharing. So can I get to the next slide, please? Uh, when we, we mixed up, it used the feminist political ecology and intersectionally both together, uh, we found that intervening this well, female, female feminist political ecology with intersectionality can allow examination of the interrelated power differences and norm with the structures uh, more you know, efficiently and all more clear, with more clarity and uh, which help us to get visibility of their uh, uh, regions and factors that's causing their suffering and their you know hesitation or their um, or or their enabling participation we wanted to understand how gender intersects with other social categories and structural power dynamics to create differential access to and control over natural resources as we followed uh, Elborg Nightingale and, and Nightingale, their policy, their feminist political ecology theories, and intersectional resources. Researchers actually consider how race, gender, class, sexuality, national gender, other socially constructed dimensions, difference are always interesting. Over, we found it is overlapping. So, so I think can I go to the next slide, please? And also, Kobe also stressed that. And method, we used methodological finance. We actually, uh, according to Crenshaw, we found there are six methodological tenants, but we used only three more. Normally we use three. One, we studied oppression. What are the intersectional factors that really, uh, you know, really make the women oppressed, the recognition of oppression and power? This was under, central to the understanding marginalization of the women, mostly from the first user women who are uh, from indigenous communities and mostly in Dalits. And within Dalits also we found there are different, different groups of Dalits actually, who are really, who are more suffered than the, some other Dalits. We have here one Bishukarma group, and one per year group, when, uh, up to six subcasts of Dalits. Among them, per years are more, you know, uh, recognized as uh, occupational class or successful group, but the, uh, because our Vishwakarmas are re regarded more successful and the per years are looked at, uh, you know, very differently that they are there. They, it is called that they are lower in their uh, caste, caste uh, what to say, I don't know the, to, the category. Even if it is, it's so painful to uh, speak like that now, but it's still today also it exists. The discrimination exists. And these are the discrimination which uh, we just, we cannot go for women as homogeneous group. They're so heterogeneous, heterogeneous um, within the same caste, heterogeneous within the same gender, like, uh, if we, we found some widows, uh, widows, if we consider the single women as homogeneous category, uh, it could have, uh, you know, uh, it could have been, uh, have hampered our uh, findings because we found uh, the age-wise elderly woman who was single, she had more opportunities and more, you know, in one way, she was more comfortable with uh, her mobile, would be for moving around very freely, but younger uh, woman, single woman with two children, in one case, she was really hesitating to move around very comfortably because she she would be teased, she would be accused of talking to men, etc. So these are some you know hidden agendas which we cannot find if we take them as a Dalit single woman. So we wanted to understand more about the particular you know, individual level uh, experiences from them. And oppression and dominance between women based on death, caste, marital standard, and land holding and well-being demonstrated. 
the relationality and complexity of women both in society and household it is very clear and actually uh, land holding also we found uh, women of same caste and same same kind of uh, you know same level of economic uh, status but they found they were facing problems differently because one group had land uh, ownership not by women though at least by their men but another group never had you know ownership to land they were they live with uh, you know very scaring condition they were not they were not stable in mind that uh, whether they will they will be allowed to stay there or not in their way so these are the some these were some you know uh, factors which really uh, hinder their um, attitude to towards participation in uh, project activities and for undertaking forest based enterprises uh, so before we implemented the project activity we studied we conducted this kind of studies but throughout the project from the very beginning to the end of the project we continued the study and relationality of a woman is really compounded i think i don't have to explain uh, alpaxi has explained this context and complexity and i already talked geographical location migration status you see also it mentioned migration status and proximity to market outlets because since we are working with uh, encouraging enterprise development so market was a very important uh, important you know aspect in our project so uh, some had proximity to market outlets and some didn't uh, in that comparison they like bamboo bamboo craft producers in two one one hill area there was one group and on the tarai areas there's one group so in both cases both were producing baskets bamboo baskets and bamboo crafts very nicely it was their traditional traditional livelihood but we just um, uh, announced their quality and design etc and connected to market and to private own buyers and also uh, you know connected to the government uh, policy makers so they they give some uh, kind of um, reduction of tax like that and they were doing good but it's still uh, the, the the women in the hill area who didn't have market outlet nearby the suffer the most and recently there was some conflict also so in many instances we must be obliged to stay obey all the socially you know what to say given uh, socially predicted or socially designed uh, norms and values this always hamper their mobility their decision making this also i we found it is not uh, same same for the all women of the same caste so it is same group and also it could go very in you know a uh, very um, micro level details if you look at households can i go to the next slide please i would like to tell you the method these are not new method these are all uh, we participatory training or participatory research but the evaluation method we used uh, this girl you see this is she is from a nearby village to the village near the market near the marketplace near the town but still because they are they don't have land they are kind of migrated community from another play another district to their this place and they uh, don't even uh, have the courage to stand on their own feet because they think they are doing some illegal activity actually they're not uh, because they have the right to ask for land allocation from the government but they uh, they always uh, feel very fear to talk to the powerful people authorities so here you can see we were very surprised to see that that kind of that kind of community that level of you know illiter illiteracy uh, um, illiteracy and unawareness within this group was very shocking because they are live very close to the marketplace but they also very skilled in bamboo craft and many uh, you know be, m m making bags and caps from from fibers from the forest and they are livelihood totally depends on the forest they have nothing no any land to cultivate they don't cannot go to go and take jobs outside 
because they have, don't have legal status, legal civil status. But they lie on the, they live with the forest and they still, they think that they don't have the right to forest resources. These kind of areas were very uh, interesting for us. So we uh, studied there which kind of, uh, you know, uh, which kind of, uh, you know, problems they face. Here also, you know, this very interestingly, if we talk about gender, this by age also, if there also we found some women are very good to talking to the forest bird and they go to the forest without any hesitation, they can collect forest resources very easily. But some, some women who are a bit, you know, uh, younger, they feel very, very scared to go to the forest because of uh, the possibility of getting uh, what to say, raped also. So some very mi micro level issues were discussed and these kind of uh, experiences uh, though those those this community all women always faced it, but they could never never tell anybody because they cannot live without the forest. So they do not did not want to you know protest the forest girls' behavior. Uh, but this kind of uh, information we got through participatory mapping and storytelling. Participatory mapping mapping the forest area in their own way whether they can draw in the river, whether they can, they can draw um, some trees or bushes like that, and which way they enter the forest and what happens in the whole journey like that. And then, then focus group discussion with uh, different categories, some uh, single women only, and men also, we, some, we discuss with men also. And this continued continuously, we kept on discussing this kind of issues. And from storytelling and oral histories, narratives were collected and how they get excluded, uh, why, why they feel so, why they don't talk to others that they are being excluded, uh, what, what are the aspirations like that. And personally, sometimes uh, once they get closer, they wanted to talk to you personally also because it was a 30 months project there was time and uh, our staff kept, used to keep going. The same people keep going and being very closer to them. It was a very nice experience too and ethnographic observation, how the whole, their culture, their social behavior, their all uh, you know, traditional systems, culture systems, the power, pay, Etc. Uh, so among these all methods, uh, we found the storytelling, even if it takes longer time, and um, conveying the oral histories by women of different age group, uh, men also, young youth. We also got closer to the youth because we found the uh, young men were being exploited by the powerful authority or some um, forest mafia uh, for smuggling. And they didn't know that they, they are being exploited, that they are being misused. They thought they are getting jobs and it, it was not like that. So this youth, uh, we later, we also got you know touch with the youth and we really were shocked to listen to them, how they described about their painful journey with the timber smuggling always kept hidden, uh, always kept threatened, and always uh, being dominated by the uh, forest mafia group, jungle mafia. But now, I, after this project, they are now organized into sports group, uh, and they are doing better, you know, uh, timber processing job with the government also. Can I go to the next slide, please? So what we found as you know, for our use for policy and social change, the intersectional recognition. Uh, we found that families and women, uh, what, what to, how to capacitate the families and, and women to build up more better relationship, mutual respect and cooperation and work sharing and supporting each other. We learned from their own stories and those uh, factors actually elements they turn into elements for 
uh, providing training courses or consultation or counseling, etc. Then we adopted gender responsive intersectional methodology throughout the project, uh, whether it is a uh, enterprise and we included gender and social inclusion training for government officials from forest officials and for political people, all the responsible local government people and uh, forest guard uh, and all the community people, community forest users group executives, so that they uh, also start thinking very specifically, responding very specifically for the specific needs of the different, different, different persons, individuals providing funds and opportunity. Now, the, uh, we call it Palikai, the municipal, the rural municipalities have started giving funds and creating opportunities for employment or enhancing the enterprise. They are continuing to support to the enterprise. Some, not all, we have 18 groups in different districts, totally far one from another. But now there are 12 groups out of them have been getting funding and opportunities, but yet uh, it is you know, very realistic to share with you. It's not for empowerment. It is for kind of uh, you know, tangible benefits. How, how, many, uh, how many items you produced, how many items you could market like that. Policy dialects, this was the strongest means to build up uh, better understanding between the entrepreneurs and policy makers and implementers. Policy dialects were, Women entrepreneurs, they came forward and they shared, they were given very friendly forum, very cozy forum, so that they can speak out because of the exercise they did with the project staff through storytelling, etc. So they became quite open, quite vocal, and they could speak their experiences, how how they got, you know. Disturb in disturbing the for collecting forest resources, why they are getting this kind of you know uh, misbehave from the forest people. So these are openly told, and later policy makers and the government people, local government people, and also forest officials also became quite closer to them. And this was possible because we could bring bring evidences from the community, very, you know, deep rooted experiences we could collect through intersectional approach. And enhancing the intersectional accountability, I think it is, we had consortium partners, four consortium partners, one women's network, one private business network, one private, private forest growers, and another resource forest external resource. And we made a choice to work with community forest user group because it's a very potential uh, platform for empowering women in their forest enterprises because they have uh, good policies, like 50% users group must be women and men, and they have special policies for the uh, Dalit and indigenous women and indigenous private people. They have quite, you know, good policies, even if they, uh, but I think uh, they are the community forest user group in Nepal is doing quite well in uh, quite progressively for uh, responsive, gender responsive, uh, you know, actions. I, I am hesitant to say transformative because yes, they had uh, lots of women, many women came from to the government political parties from this this group all over Nepal, but yet the capacity of the women in leadership, all men in understanding gender relationship quite, you know, uh, product, uh, for productive purpose was, lack, was lacking. And I think still we found that there are a lot to do with, the, with empowering the community first users group to really address, listen to the women from the specific groups, a specific condition, a specific situation, and working with them for the uh, what the sustainable benefits sharing 
and equitable beneficiaries from the forest development activities. Actually, the women in, in Nepal work more than men in forest conservation and preservation. It is already documented. Also, it is the community forest user group has a good platform, it is also documented. But yet, I think uh, what we learned from the project, now we are distributing in different forums. Let us see how it goes. But the, we were lucky to provide evidences also to community forest user group, um, national federation, FECO fund. The, there is federation of community users group. So we are discussing with them on these issues. So coordination with local government, creation of women leadership, these were the outcome type of thing from the intersectional approach, evidence, um, intersectional approach and the evidences we got through that, uh, those processes. Next, next, next slide, please. And then challenges, uh, chal we face many challenges. Interference by the political parties, the political leaders and development agencies acknowledge the inter they, they don't acknowledge that interestingly approach they keep it very simple that yes you know kind of uh, this is this is happening well, what what is different what is different that would be their question and i don't go in detail and double standard of the elite women in the in some community first users group there would be 50 percent women in the executive uh, committee of women and men but still uh, elite women would Dominate if the Dalit woman say something, speak up something. Uh, we have seen several instances, they still dominate. And understanding of the multi dimensional operations is quite critical and quite challenging for us, too. And our positionality, our reflexivity was a challenge for ourselves. So these were some challenges we faced, and we tried to deal with, uh, you know, uh, deal through more cooperation and collaboration with each other. Next slide, please. I think it is last. Any conclusion? I think uh, conclusion, um, I think it is more than that what we have learned. Uh, it is it, a proven effective in uncovering, uncovering the nuanced realities of women's evolving roles, which are influenced by very socioeconomic, varying socioeconomic and political forces, as well as interpersonal relationship with household decision making processes. I think this was the most, you know, uh, important uh, part for us, which, which we carry on. We are already, uh, you know, discussing many events and we are carrying on this for further dissemination. Thank you. I pass it to Amrita Gupta. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kanjanji. Thank you so much for this very, very enlightening, you know, presentation on uh, intersectionality and actually it's uh, how it is operational in an evaluation. And it also tells us, you know, what, uh, what is what I was uh, reflecting upon. And I think uh, <clears throat> Alpakshi did talk about uh, Kimberly's uh, definition. And she did talk about the idea that, you know, intersectionality is the buzzword that has happened. So intersectionality, actually, she and, and this is something that Kimberly herself said, it is an old problem in societies. I'm not talking about something new. I'm just talking about it in relation to uh, race and gender, specifically with Black women's experiences. And that, I think, also the fact that, you know, the UN uh, system at that time uh, did put the intersectionality discourse on the forefront because Kimberly was uh, also uh, asked to, you know, come and speak at a UN uh, uh, forum. So intersectionality as a political concept also got a lot of leverage, but it is an old problem that has been there with, uh, you know, the global South, South Asian societies, and, and it is contentious because feminists uh, have discussed and debated whether they have included, say, for example, in India or in Nepal, the Dalit feminists and the, the larger mainstream feminists have always have a contentious issue, whether they have been included, whether they have not been included. So intersectionality has always been a, a, a very contentious but very topical issue. And largely, intersectionality is the idea is about 
hearing the voices of the marginalized, the ones who fall through the cracks. And within gender transformative evaluations, when we talk about differential power, when we talk about how power stru structures are changing, how transformation is happening, intersectionality, like Tanchanji has very, very, uh, in a very detailed manner shown us how listening to stories, how, of course, it is very politically challenged, of course, it is difficult, but it takes time. It, it also is uh, not something that you can explain to others. It's not very easy to explain what, why do you need to hear the voice of the powerless or why are they voiceless? For example, if we look at the most marginalized adolescent girls who are married early in tribal areas, I've, take, I've taken a very, uh, you know, intersectional experience. People would say, but that's okay. Adolescent girls are always covered in within, uh, uh, within uh, you know, there's a larger uh, area of work on adolescent girls. There's a larger area of work on tribes. And of course, there's early marriage. But why would we look at the people who are at the intersection of these three and falling through the cracks? That is the voice of intersectionality, and that is, is, is the importance of power that is very, very critical. And uh, I will take two uh, examples here. One of uh, an evaluation, a, a compilation that Jensa had undertaken uh, some in 2022, uh, where they, we had looked at uh, uh, some, <clears throat> we had looked at uh, evaluation interventions that engaged with men and boys. And here again, we had tried to look at the, the intersection of, while we were not looking at the intersection of only intersectionality and gender transformative approach, we were trying to map inter interventions because this is an area that has already always been an, a new issue. It has all still, it is still at the margins when we talk about gender transformative work. Working with boys, uh, you know, gen, uh, I mean, of course, it's a buzzword today because, you know, uh, there's there's been a lot of uh, uh, work and a lot of uh, monetary inflow around it, but it is still a very nascent issue. It is still an area which is underexplored. And within that, while gender transformative approach is definitely being looked at, why? Because we are looking at the idea of power the power across genders, the power that gender norms, gender roles bring in. And we are looking at it when we are looking at what men are doing vis-a-vis -vis women. But, and within that also, as we have seen, the role of intersectionality is something that is very, very critically mentioned as shaping masculinities. It's recognized very clearly that masculinities or working with men and boys, they are not a monolith. They are not an entity that is a homogeneous entity. They do, the social interactions vary with caste, class, ethnicity, race. But because it is an early, because it is an issue that still needs a lot of work. And, and that's, that's something that is very, very uh, critical that I would want to raise here. What happens is that when the larger problems are being still addressed, the problems still go back to the construct of hegemonic masculinity. The construct of, you know, how do we move power from a hegemonic masculinity to a positive masculinity? And falling through the cracks, therefore, are the intersections. For example, the trans men. Are we adequately talking about gender-based violence in trans men? Is that a part of the masculinity studies that I'm sure there are studies that are happening now, but are they in the mainstream? Are we talking about the Dalit men and their masculinities? Are they different masculinities? So these are things that in each, our initial evaluation with uh, when we did that uh, of, uh, if this was in South Asian context, we found that yes, there's a recognition of intersectionality, but it is still an area which needs to be addressed and will need that much more importance, even, even that much more, uh, you know, resources from that perspective. So it's a very, therefore, intersectionality is not so easy. Therefore, a 360 degree approach that Kanchan Lamaji was saying, the continuous, uh, you know, uh, pushing that, inter that, that lens needs to be there when we are looking at 
gender transformative approaches. We are looking at evaluations at every level. We need to be constantly open to the lens of intersection. Then my next example would be a, a localized example. It'll be from India. And this is an evaluation of a leadership program with adolescent girls. And uh, the, the program was, uh, you know, used the methodology of, you know, outcome harvesting and, and where uh, detailed uh, focus group discussions were conducted with adolescent girls, their parents, and not just parents, it is mothers and fathers separate. So here, the thought of intersectionality, since the most of these adolescent girls were from a marginalized community already, the thought of intersectionality was not embedded in the original uh, harvesting, nor was it embedded in the uh, in the in the programmatic approach as such. But there was an open, uh, you know, openness to understanding what are the lens that are coming through, what are the different threads that are coming through. There was an openness to understanding voices of different people, and hence, while we did miss out, I would say differences of religious identity. We did miss out girls who were facing what kind of disability and how did it in, impact women. We got many other intersectional experiences. We got girls who had faced violence at home, visiting girls who had not faced violence at home and their differential experiences. Just because we were uh, open or the lenses, lens was there that we need to look at multiple intersections of girls who are falling through the cracks, who are unable to access leadership qualities or unable to access careers and this was a this was largely about careers in stem uh, and uh, careers where women are are obvious uh, are already facing a lot of marginalization so uh, we got different kinds of intersections we got girls with single mothers and their storyline how it was different from girls who had both parents who were earning Girls with supportive parents versus vis-a-vis -vis girls with non-supportive parents. So, you know, intersectionality, uh, uh, if we keep the lens open, can be, can come in or, or appear in different forms. They need not be the, uh, the lines of inquiry like religious, caste, class, disability, and ability, but it can be different lines. And it is about keeping an open lens that is very, very critical and a lot of, you know, conversations. And while that is difficult, while uh, evaluations have focused on, uh, do not always focus on mixed method approach, maybe they don't have that kind of timeline, maybe that kind of resources, but that leads itself to a more deeper, you know, introspection of intersectionality. I will end my uh, slide here and uh, hand it over to Mahesh. Uh, Mahesh, over to you. You can see the screen, right? Hello. Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mahesh Krishnan. I'm an independent social and behavior change consultant. And today I'll be uh, uh, acting as a discussion for this panel discussion. So I'll be summarizing the key points that we discussed, and then I will be bringing up, out some of the key takeaways from the discussion. So the first key takeaway is about understanding the ideal types in evaluation. So there is no single ideal approach that perfectly fits all evaluation contexts. Evaluations must consider the unique political, structural, and resource-oriented challenges specific to each context. The second uh, key takeaway is about the importance of intersectionality. Intersectionality is crucial for a comprehensive evaluation, acknowledging the diverse and overlapping identities within any given population while striving to uh, uh, for a 360 degree evaluation approach is important. We must recognize the limitations and challenges inherent in achieving this ideal. The third key takeaway is the practical constraints and achievements. 
complete inclusivity in evaluation is difficult but we must aim to include as many marginalized groups as possible the goal is to maximize intersectionality within the practical constraints we face the fourth uh, key takeaway is the impact of marginalization missing out on marginalized groups can significantly skew evaluation results and hinder effective policy formulation ensuring that evaluations account for the most marginalized can lead to more equitable and effective outcomes so now putting it all together we've seen through kanchan's presentation on how participatory tools like storytelling can effectively highlight the multiple layers of marginalization faced by women in nepal uh, through amrita's insights we have underscored the importance of intersectionality in evaluation programs uh focused on adults and girls and young women in india and through alpakshi's discussion uh we have brought out to light the critical need for a deep and practical understanding of intersectionality in gender transformative evaluations yeah. so now uh i would like to open this uh panel uh to everyone for questions as you reflect on this presentation uh, uh consider these points how can we better integrate intersectional approaches within the constraints of time and resources what are some practical steps to ensure that intersectionality go goes beyond a buzzword in evaluations and how can participatory methods like storytelling and outcome mapping enhance our understanding of the intersectional challenges so yeah uh, you can start giving your questions and reflections on the panel discussion we would invite people to have uh, with any questions i know we are over time but uh, if you could stay on for another 5 minutes and it would be great uh, if you could if you have any questions any burning thoughts uh, which you would like to share please raise your hand and it will be really great to have hear you Have Lakshman who's raised his hand. Lakshman, would you unmute yourself, or do you need help? Oh, great! I can. Hello, everyone. Thank you. This was a great conversation, and thanks to all of you for being. So, few thoughts that are coming. No, if we really want to expand uh, the appropriate and meaningful ways to incorporate intersectionality. uh probably one question comes to mind is that do we need to then realize that the current evaluation frameworks are not really capable of doing so and hence probably this community should also consider looking at developing potentially new ways of evaluations and indicators that could meaningfully incorporate the essence of intersectionality and i think the current evaluation frameworks being very eurocentric and donors driven uh processes and i think konjanji used this you know storytelling which has been very indigenous way of evaluations but i think that is not well recognized in the academic or eurocentric discourses yet no mm -hmm. so maybe i think there there is a time and space for for you know jensa and colleagues to reconsider developing and figuring out new tools that can help in meaningfully integrating and uh you know showcasing how important that you know the intersectional approach means in terms of evaluation so that could be one thing that comes to mind right now after listening to all of you uh, thank you thank you thank you so much lakshmi kanchan ji would you like to uh, respond or mm. uh, thank Shepard. you lakshman uh, you really appreciated the way actually uh, these days un women also in nepal uh, you know promoting a storytelling for even for monitoring because you know uh, this qualitative method actually in these all these uh, uh, processes in our project we adapted quantitative 
and qualitative. And it was very difficult for me as a principal investigator to really deal with such um, traditional researchers whom we actually uh, recruited as uh, experts uh, who are producing academic paper out of the three academic papers are coming out by this end of the December. We, I will share them with you. Um, it was one was economist and one was business expert and was a gender. Gender is different, not problematic, but uh, it, it was so difficult for uh, dealing with the academic researchers that, you know, yes, okay, quantitative uh, data, quantitative assessment of quantitative evaluation or research is okay. This, is, this should be there, of course, but the narrative is equally important for us in this project, actually, uh, how uh, the marginalized and most poor deprived groups of women who are being deprived of forest resources, they don't have access, they cannot speak out of their uh, you know, problems to outsiders because they don't even have, some of them don't even have a legal status of civil status. So it's so complicated. Those kind of things, you know, it is not only possible for to being out of quantitative data only. They won't say it is not recorded in the local government data. They are not, they don't exist in the local government data, those people. So it was very helpful for us, you know, the, the intersectional approach. So we had to go for storytelling because otherwise they don't speak anything. So they are experienced suffering actually, or winning or happiness or sorrow. This all came together. So I think that's why we tried that, but we cannot claim that that is only the best thing, but for us, it was best. Time taking though. Thank you, Kanchanji. Alpakshi, would you want to come in uh, with your uh, perspective on the course that you were talking about? Uh, no, oh, sure. So yeah, in case uh, people want to talk and learn and uh, I mean, discuss more on intersectionality, I understand that this is uh, just the beginning of the discussion. Uh, one hour is definitely not enough. There is a course called Facilitating Gender Transformative Evaluation, which is uh, done by ISST. And they do uh, one course for early to mid career professionals and one course for senior professionals every year. It's a free course, therefore competitive uh, applications. But uh, I urge people to apply, follow ISST for dates uh, of applications and all. And uh, it might be of interest to some of you to understand and work more on intersectionality. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshman. Thank you, Kanchan. And thank you, Alpakshi. I we are on. We are almost ten minutes. If we do not have any other questions. It would be great uh, to say, I mean, you know, end this rather short and like Alpakshi was saying, this discussion on intersectionality is not enough, but it would be, uh, we would like to end this discussion and thank you all for staying on, for uh, bearing with us, bearing with the technical glitch that we faced and for participating uh, with us. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you to Jensa. And on that note, have a great evening, morning to everybody who's joined us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ah. Thank you.